This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Look at old restaurant menus from the 19th and early 20th centuries, and a clear correlation emerges. The fancier the restaurant, the bigger the menu. So many choices. These days, you generally observe the opposite correlation, right? Like, this is Emilia, easily the best upscale place I've been to here yet in Knoxville, Tennessee. The wine list makes the menu look big, but there's the food. It's just half a dozen pastas, three meats, one fish. That's it. To a discerning contemporary diner, such as myself, a short menu is generally a good sign, right? A short menu means the people running this place know who they are, they know what they do well, they're not trying to be everything to everyone, which is, of course, impossible. In contrast, when I see a place with a huge menu, I am suspicious. How could they possibly be really good at all these different things? How fresh could any of this really be? The only way to have this many options under one roof is to keep a lot of them in the freezer. So what changed? How did having a giant menu go from being a high-class status symbol to being the opposite of that? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of explanations, but first, let me show you some crazy old menus. I have been obsessed with this book that Lauren found for me, Menu Design in America, from 1850 to 1985. Bill of fare for number one Spring Lane in Boston. Check this run-on sentence. For neatness of arrangement in every particular, and the discipline of the waiters, together with the culinary department, where the utmost care and skill is requisite for the preparation of food, we can defy competition in this city or elsewhere. Period. Finally. Please honor us with a visit and satisfy yourself with the truth of this assertion. Sorry, that's not really relevant to the discussion at hand, I just think it's awesome. Anyway, look at the menu. Eleven soups. 13 roasts. You want the green goose or the mongrel goose? Nine boiled meats, including calf's head. Six different savory pies. 11 different entrees, like crackers and milk. Mmm. If you're in the United States like I am, you might be super confused right now because here we use the word entree to mean the main dish. But that's technically wrong. In French, entree just means entrance. And so the French use the word to describe like appetizers, things you have before the main dish. And back in the 19th century, we Americans still used that word correctly. So the crackers and milk is not a main dish, thank God. 21 different chops and steaks cooked to order. 20 different fish. 12 vegetables, including pickled limes. And look at all the desserts. These days, the dessert is the shortest part of the menu, right? But back then, it was the longest. Hey, you want a bird's nest pudding or a brown dumpling? I'll give you a brown dumpling. Now look, you could argue that these old menus aren't quite as big as they look because everything is listed and served a la carte. You're not ordering a meat dish that also comes with a veg. You're ordering the meat and the veg separately, and so everything is listed separately, and that inflates the size of the menu. Sure. Nowadays, you probably wouldn't see every cheese they have listed individually for sale. There would just be one menu item, cheese plate. A la carte ordering was the fashion a century ago, but that's part of the broader phenomenon that explains why fancy restaurant menus were huge back then. Back then, the luxury that rich people were paying for was choice. The luxury to waltz into a place and order anything you want. These are menus written for a much smaller world where people had way fewer choices. If you're like me and you live in an urban area in a highly developed country, you can get pretty much any food anytime. It might not necessarily be the best of whatever it is, but you can get it. This is a very new situation made possible by globalization and related advances in food storage technology. 19th century restaurants had no mechanical refrigeration, no vacuum packing, no giant container ships bringing them pallets of stuff from the other side of the world. They had what they could get from nearby farmers. And indeed, if you look at old menus from inexpensive mom and pop type places for normal people, those are very small. The big menus were at the kind of places where those dudes would eat. Oh, hey, that's Mark Twain. An exclusive luxury for the elite is something that is both desirable and rare. Choice used to be rare. Now, choice is common. 
the choices that you would get at like even a cheap grocery store nowadays, those choices would completely blow the minds of the fancy guys in white tie you see in this book. Choice is no longer rare, therefore it is no longer exclusive, therefore it is no longer a high status symbol. Back then, it was. And there's another reason big menus were a status symbol. Something having more to do with the customer than with the restaurant itself. This is explained by Indiana University historian Dr. Rebecca Spang in her book The Invention of the Restaurant, linked in the description. I think the um, marker of sophistication in taste has shifted enormously over the course of the past 100 years. You could really say just over the course of the past 40 years. So it's gone from um, that copiousness and everybody can get whatever you want. And then it's up to the consumer to be so sophisticated as to be able to look at this menu that has 500 items on it and say, oh, I know that one's good. Right? I mean, again, think about the challenge of being faced with a very long wine list. You might have had that experience, right? You go to a fancy restaurant and there's like 12 things on the menu, but there's 1,200 things on the wine list. Wine is a totally different kind of good because it doesn't spoil as rapidly as food does. And so a fancy restaurant today will still put a flex on you by keeping hundreds of different bottles in its cellar. And then you get to flex on your dinner buddies by saying to the waiter, oh yes, okay, I believe we shall have the uh, Frenchy French 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 and the 97 vintage, not the 98, anything but the 98. And you would really impress everybody. The same thing happened back in the day with the menus. People would impress other people by knowing what to order off of the giant food menu. Oh. <laughs> and then we get the um, caricatures from the 1830s and 40s of restaurant customers. This is where the anxiety that one might not be a good enough restaurant customer, right, that learning how to behave in a restaurant all right, so here is how you're supposed to behave in a restaurant, um, was very much part of middle-class culture in the 19th and 20th century. But notice again how our dandy, um, with his fashionable striped socks that match his fashionable striped trousers, um, he's just gotten the bill and he's a bit taken aback by it. Don't worry, buddy, we've all been there. Anyway, Dr. Spang says that this whole big menu equals fancy thing that didn't really end until the latter 20th century. Now, um, there's been an inversion. Some would date it to the Nouvelle Cuisine of the 1970s and 80s. That's certainly important. Nouvelle Cuisine was a French culinary movement that emphasized simplicity and freshness. You can keep your food fresher if you're keeping a really small menu, right? Because you're turning product really fast. Also, you're only cooking what's in season. But also the call to the celebrity chef. The idea that the person who's doing the cooking knows much better than you what it is you will want, what it is you will like, what it is is good. Indeed, the last menu in this book is from 1985 and Spago, the Los Angeles restaurant that made Wolfgang Puck a star. It's not a short menu, but it's not super long either. What's the exclusive luxury today? Well, it's certainly not choice. Even the riffraff have choice. No, it's quality in all the different ways that people could define that word. Defined as actual quality or the illusion of quality you create by making a good artificially scarce. Maybe quality is the particular vision of a particular chef, something that can only be had at this one place. And it doesn't have to be super expensive. Like, this is a food stall here in Knoxville that does a mashup of Korean and Southern American food. They cook like five things, they do them all extremely well, and there's nothing quite like that bat bowl anywhere else. That's the kind of place I wanna eat. But big menus do persist in the contemporary world. And that brings us back to the Cheesecake Factory, the American restaurant chain with the longest and most diverse menu known to science. That's not wine list, that's food. Sliders, pot stickers, egg rolls, tacos, shepherd's pie, a burger with mac and cheese on it, 20 different pastas, salads with influences from all over the world before you even get to the cheesecake section. 
Now look, if you're waiting for Adam to do a brutal takedown of the Cheesecake Factory, keep waiting. I don't do that. Why? Because I remember this 2013 local news story from WMGT in Macon, Georgia, linked in the description. 61-year-old Deborah Monroe was dying of COPD and she had one wish, to eat at Olive Garden, another casual chain here in the States. The hospice and a nonprofit called the Dream Foundation sent Deborah to the Macon Olive Garden in a limo, and as long as I live, I will try to not mock the things that people sincerely enjoy. And hey, we ate at Cheesecake Factory the other day, and everything we got was good. But there was nothing particular to the vision of each dish. How could there be? There's a thousand dishes on that menu. That's not why you go to the Cheesecake Factory. You go there because nearly every kind of food imaginable is on the menu, and so everybody can get what they want, even the people at your table with not the most adventurous taste. And such people also deserve to get something they like, don't you think? But that very appeal to a mass audience is the polar opposite of exclusivity. And I'm not here to say whether that's a good or a bad thing. I'm just here to explain why the most exclusive restaurants in the world used to have giant menus and now they have tiny menus. Hey, let's say your restaurant needs a menu, an online menu. You can make one in like 10 minutes with Squarespace, the sponsor of this video. A million other restaurants have. You just grab a website template and you start customizing it with your own content. You can change the whole look and feel of the site with a few clicks and then it looks like yours, not somebody else's. Whether you're starting a restaurant, or starting a store, or just starting a career, there's a template at squarespace.com made for what you are doing. Like a simple resume site like this. You can start playing around with one of these for free whenever you want. You only have to pay to do something like registering a domain name. AdamRagusia.com, for example. That's a Squarespace site. And you'd have to pay to publish your site, because then Squarespace hosts it for you on their servers. You can save 10% on your site by using my code RAGUSIA at checkout. Put yourself on the menu that is the internet. And put this old book on your list if you're interested in both food and graphic design. I think we're gonna have to do a whole video that's just a random list of crazy things I found in here. Like that. Like, what's up with that?